Let's now talk about the chain rule in multivariable calculus. And here's the simplest version of it. Let's call it multivariable chain rule number one. So suppose f is a differentiable function of x and y. And here, differentiable means the definition we saw a little earlier, which means that the graph of f is well approximated by its tangent plane. And in particular, the partial derivatives are well defined. Now suppose also that x and y are differentiable functions of another variable t. And here, differentiable just means that their derivatives are defined for every value of t. Now, we could try to think of f as a function of t. So what the chain rule says is df dt is partial f partial x dx dt plus partial f partial y dy dt. So in this equation, if f were only a function of x and not a function of y, then this first term is what you would get from the single variable chain rule. And if f were only a function of y and not a function of x, then the second term is what you would get from the single variable chain rule. But when f depends on both x and y, you need to add both of these terms. Now, to be a little more precise, we should specify where we are evaluating these functions. So more precisely, let's write z of t equals f of x of t comma y of t then dz dt evaluated at t equals df dx. And where are we going to evaluate this? Well, there's sort of an obvious point to evaluate it at, which is the point x of t comma y of t times dx dt evaluated at t plus partial f partial y evaluated at x of t, y of t, times dy dt, evaluated at t. So how can we think of this intuitively? Well, intuitively, let's think of f as the height function. Okay, so we have some mountain range that we're walking around on. And think of the function sending t to the point x of t comma y of t as a parameterized curve in the plane. OK, and then f as a function of t says, what is our altitude at time t? And then the chain rule says, at what rate is the altitude changing with respect to time? Well, there are two contributions. The first contribution comes from the x component of our velocity vector. So um, this is the x component of the velocity vector. And then we multiply by the slope in the x direction. Okay, And then this is the y component of the velocity vector, and we multiply by the slope in the y direction. And when we add up those two contributions, we get the total change in f. Okay, so let's do an example. So 
So suppose that f of xy equals y squared minus x squared. All right, so the graph of this is the notorious hyperbolic paraboloid. And let me just do a very quick sketch of it this time. So it sort of goes up along the y-axis and down along the x-axis like that. Okay, now what are x and y going to be? So let's say x of t equals t and y of t equals t. And z of t is f of x of t comma y of t. All right, so what is dz dt? Well, it's partial f partial x dx dt plus partial f partial y dy dt. Okay, so partial f partial x is minus 2x and dx dt is 1. And then partial f partial y is 2y and dy dt is 1. But we're not quite done yet because we want this as a function of t. So what we need to do is substitute um, for x and y what they are as functions of t. Now here x and y are both equal to t. So this becomes minus 2t plus 2t, which is 0. And well, now that we think about it, that's kind of obvious because if x and y are equal, then f is equal to 0. So, of course, the derivative will be 0. And we can draw on the picture this um, hyperbolic paraboloid. Its graph contains a line in the xy plane where x equals y. It also contains a line where x equals minus y. Okay. Now let's do one more example. So let's keep f, but change what x and y are. So let's make some space for this. So example two, so we'll still have f of x, y equals y squared minus x squared. But now we'll have x of t equals t and y of t equals t squared. Okay, so what do we think dz dt is going to look like? So in the xy plane, we're moving along a parabola, so which looks like this. Now, if we look at the surface, it's a little bit hard to see from the sketch, but initially it looks like we're going to go down on the surface, and then later it looks like we're going to start going up. So we're going to expect, so writing z equals f of x of t comma y of t, we expect dz dt is negative for z greater than zero, sorry, for t greater than zero and small, and dz dt is positive for t greater than zero and large. Now let's do the calculation and see if that's what we get. So by the chain rule, dz dt equals df dx dx dt plus df dy dy dt. So df dx is minus 2x and dx dt is 1 and df dy is 2y and dy dt is 2t. And now we have to substitute x and y. Okay. Um, so we get, um, 
So for the minus 2x gives us uh, minus 2t, and the plus 2y gives us now we have a 2t squared times 2t, so we get 4t cubed. And then you can say, when is this positive or negative? Well, so dz dt is 2t times 2t squared minus 1. Right, and this is positive if t is positive and also if 2t squared is bigger than 1. So if it's positive if t is greater than 1 over the square root of 2 and it's negative if t is between 0 and 1 over the square root of 2. Right? Now, it wasn't really necessary to use the chain rule here because we could have just plugged in x of t equals t and y of t equals t squared into this equation to get z as a function of t, and then we could have differentiated that. So note, we can also just write z equals y squared, which is t to the fourth, minus x squared, which is, gives us a minus t squared. And then we could differentiate this, and we get the same thing over here. Um, however, in general, the chain rule is very useful for various kinds of problems, as we'll see.